Hi, everybody. Juleka here. I'm the host and creator of How to Talk to Mommy and Papi About Anything. And I want to invite you to be on our show. If you're an adult and a child of immigrants from anywhere in the world, I'd love to talk to you about those conversations that are hard but necessary. Things about politics, dating, career, parenting. Seriously, no topic is off limits. Send us an email at hello at talktomommypapi.com and let's get you on the show. That's hello at talktomommypapi.com. See you soon. Hi, everybody. We continue with our series about food and families. We've asked some of our teammates at LWC Studios to come on the show and share their experiences with their loved ones. We'll explore some of the tensions that come up around food and families during the holidays. And along the way, we'll get some guidance on how we can all cope. Today, I'm really excited to have Kojin on the show because he is our resident foodie. This dude can cook. Trust me, we've all enjoyed his cooking. And get this, almost everyone in Kojin's Japanese family can really cook. For someone like me who loves food, that would be a dream during the holidays. But not for Kojin, whose family gets extremely competitive. And kitchen drama can often interfere with family celebrations. Let's get into it. My name is Kojin Tashiro. And I am an associate sound designer at LWC Studios, Orc Malian Podcasts, and I also uh, tend to produce other sound shows as well and documentaries. Honestly, I called my parents when I was little, Mama and Papa. My family, they all cook. I'm Japanese, I'm from Tokyo. My father, he was actually the one that taught me how to cook first, and he was having me help out in the kitchen. So, me, my cousins, my parents, my grandparents, everybody, my aunt, they all cook. We immigrated back in 96, 97. So we didn't have a lot of money. So to save money, you know, instead of going out to eat, we had to cook. And my dad's always been interested in cooking. His uncle was a sushi chef as well at one point. Okay, so the, you know, the American holidays are pretty easy going. We know what the menu is, especially Thanksgiving. You know, you got the turkey, you got the potatoes. It's very straightforward. Now, New Year's is a little bit different. If you haven't experienced Japanese New Year's, it's hard to kind of say, but there's a lot of over-preparing intricate parts. So it becomes a little bit of a showdown. Our family, you know, besides our mothers, are mostly guys. We're all very competitive. But the problem is we're also very passive-aggressive about things, too. We'll always try to compliment each other's dishes as much as possible, but you could just tell that there's a, you're just waiting for, oh, no, yours is better reply. We all secretly think that we're like the best cook. Our New Year's is very traditionally Japanese. So when something happens and the pettiness starts, sometimes it gets down to the, well, you know, like you're not from there or, you know, you're mostly American. So like you wouldn't get it type of thing. Then, you know, we're all getting older. So we're all maturing a little bit more. But back in the day, you know, when I was still in my early 20s, got in a lot of fights because uh, one time uh, I remember this one specific time where... It was a Japanese New Year's. So the traditional things that my father makes is this stewed chicken dish with burdock root and bamboo shoots. It's really really good. And my father had brought a guest who is from Japan and, you know, was trying to, she was probably talking her up, you know, like, oh, like it's going to be a traditionally Japanese and to hyping it up because he likes to do that. And we got there and my aunt, which is my dad's sister, she brought a... (laughs) My aunt, she's never had one year where she didn't make a artichoke and spinach dip, which is not very Japanese. <laughs> she just started going off as in like, oh, I'm the only one that knows how to really cook the Japanese food and y'all are ruined this sacred moment. And then we just got into a huge argument about it because, you know, my cousins are actually Japanese, but they're born in America and my sister's born in America too. So it just became a whole nother fight. And the ironic thing is, at the end of the night when we were all drunk, he was eating most of the food that other people prepared, not himself. So he ended up liking that food anyway. It's just how our family functions. We're petty and we fight over things. And a lot of the times, we just get together and cook in the same kitchen. And we talk trash, per usual. You know, we'll be cooking. And I'm guilty myself. I sometimes will see something and be like, hey, you're not doing it right. 
and then they'll be like no it's in the book i'm like yeah but you should do this and then she's like no like i'll do it and i'm like you're not doing that right and then you know my mom or aunt will end up being like well fine do it yourself then i'm like okay okay i will it's a lot of um side note correcting that happens honestly it's me my father and my cousin yeah we're very cutthroat my father is just very competitive but also he does know how to do his stuff so it's like everybody's trying to like including myself because i'm you know his oldest son so it's kind of like everybody's trying to get his approval in a sense you know what i mean we'll be talking and someone will be complimenting my dish and be like hey this is really good and they'll say something like well you know it's not the most traditional thing but it's delicious and then i'll be like well i mean if i was going to cook your dish traditionally i would use this and this so i guess we're both not too traditional from there it just like spirals you know we i think what it is is we all take food personally like um we all have a way we want to fit in and we have that one dish or that one thing that we're cooking and we get emotional about it because we feel like if somebody says something about our food it's like you know saying something personal about us every now and then it gets intense to shouting matches sometimes especially when we have a little of alcohol in us Kojin's story, not surprisingly, made me laugh. <laughs> He's a funny guy, but I also feel for him and for his family. Part of the reason for the competitiveness seems to be that everyone cares a little too much. Food is important to them as a family, so every detail matters. So, What can we as first gens do to manage difficult kitchen dynamics when all the cooks are equally invested and equally talented in getting the holiday meal right? How can we do it in a way that honors our family's culinary traditions, that includes our values, and also maybe possibly fosters teamwork? <laughs> to help us figure it out, I called in an expert. My name is Maury Wilhite. I live in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I happen to run a Japanese cooking school here. I've been doing this for the past eight years. I came here after I married the army sweetheart, and he <laughs> happened to be from here. I'm originally from San Diego. I am half Japanese. Mom was Japanese, and I had to have Japanese food in my life. So I just thought, well, we'll try in Indiana and see how it goes. So. Well, first, congrats on eight years of doing oh, something you. you love. That is a major life accomplishment. I'm going to start with the same question I always start with, which is, what did you hear in Kojin's story as you listened? Well, his family sounds close to my family, rivaling as major chefs in the kitchen. <laughs> so I thought that was cute. I'm surprised he didn't talk about any knife throwing while, you know, this is my domain, you can't come in here type thing, because that's how my mother was. All right, so let's unpack what you just said, the competitiveness in the cooking process. Yes. Where does that come from? Well, Japan is such an old culture, mm -hmm. over 2,500 years old, and we just take pride in that perfect umami flavor in your cooking In Japan, Asian culture, it isn't quantity like the U.S. It's quality. Mm -hmm. Let's break down some of the things. So I cook also. And I lived in Japan. Oh, nice. And I can make some Japanese dishes. So this is not completely oh, out I'm of... I'm so proud of you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Arigato. I don't want... And so I want to talk about a, a few things that I think are important when it comes to preparing Japanese food, which is one, technique... Mm -hmm. I feel like part of the competitiveness within families might be who has the best technique. Let's talk about the harder dishes, the things that require multiple interventions throughout the prep and cooking process. Why does that become competitive? There is a popular theory in Japan that Japanese food is popular all over the world, but to replicate the taste, not only the taste, the look, presentation as well, Mm -hmm. and getting the right or close enough ingredient has been the challenge. Mm -hmm. One of the longer recipes I know or time-consuming ones are osechi ryori, the New Year's meals. The most important holiday in Japan, aside from the emperor's birthday, and you're supposed to make it 
to last three days so that even the housewife, busy housewife could be joining with family activities for the New Year's. So a lot of that, you had to get the right ingredients to prepare it as close to what grandma or mom did back in Japan. Mm -hmm. That's the competition. How close can you be with our traditional family taste? Some people get that crazy, like my mom. So Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the difference that people perceive and experience between being, quote unquote, born and raised back home and being, quote unquote, American. How do those two things show up when people are talking about holiday meal prep and bringing signature dishes to family gatherings? You've been to Japan. Yep. You know how big a Japanese kitchen is. It's a closet. <laughs> so that's where they have to be organized and neat because they don't have all this elbow room that us Americans require. Even the way you cut and the mess, you know, my mom would tell me, if you have to destroy half the kitchen just to make this dish. Mm -hmm. When I started my cooking school, I tried to make it within reason. I was using real sake to add the umami flavor or whatever I was doing. And I let my mom, because I'm a good Asian daughter and didn't want to be chewed out, I wait till year two to let my mom show up. And I told her, please, don't chew me out in front of paying guests. Wait till they're gone. I don't want them <laughs> to think we're fighting. Because I'm not like that. I said, yes, you are, mother. Just wait till they leave before you start bashing me. So first thing she did, of course, she came in my kitchen and she looked at the sake I used. She goes, upgrade that. Don't go any lower than that. That's how my mother was in regards to cooking. Right a $40 sake with her miso soup. So I go, mom, I can't ask Americans to do that. I'm trying to get them started, not intimidated that they don't want to do Japanese cooking. And once they have a baseline with me, then they could go expand on other things. So it's interesting to me because in a way, some of the work that you're doing through your teaching is cultural translation, right? You're trying to translate the culinary and rich traditions of Japan for a modern American consumer. Yes. Can you talk to me about how you think through how do I make this accessible while still preserving the authenticity and the originality of the dish? When I'm teaching, I explain that I designed this class at Japanese standard for non-Asian people. Okay. Few things like the rice, the soy sauce, the sake, you have to buy authentic. You know, you could get regular salad or whatever, but the main core stuff and all the umami ingredients, like the kombu, katsobushi, you need that to be Japanese, Japanese in order to replicate it and, you know, have it show up in your, your meal. And then also I have the approach of, I'm going to teach you just enough to be annoying at the sushi bar. <laughs> starting with the quality of the rice. They're often, I mean, if you approach it in this way, now they're looking for faults right. with the sushi chef. And I tell them, wait until after they fed you, not during to make any comments. That's just good life advice. <laughs> just to be on the safe side and let them know. I didn't taste the umami in the miso soup. All right. So let's talk about space because you brought up a really good point, which is that Japanese kitchens traditionally are very small. You don't really have room for two people to be in there making multiple dishes. And so it's very streamlined. In an American kitchen, which is typically larger and can accommodate multiple cooks at the same time, how do you recommend people sort of assign themselves roles when they're cooking for the holidays to avoid the competitiveness, to avoid the potential tension and the knife throwing that you mentioned earlier? <laughs> <laughs> to avoid bloodshed within the family, maybe have dibs on it. Well, I want to make the sashimi platter or I want to make the toshikoshi soba or whatever, you know, they could discuss it ahead of time. I mean... We could be civil about this. It's supposed to be celebratory. <laughs> what about early prep? Like how realistic and what can you actually do that you can bring that's already prepped to the kitchen where there's going to be collective cooking that people can utilize? Well, like say, for example, if you're going to make sushi, mm -hmm. you could have everything, the rice ready, the filling parts ready and everything. And you could take it in separate pieces and then assemble it at the kitchen or the dining table real quick mm -hmm. so it could be presented at the table. Because the thing with Japanese food, fresh is best. Yes, of course. Like if they want sushi. Making a sushi roll isn't practical all the time, so I switched to the hand rolls. Yeah. So it's the same proportion, but in different shape. Put everything and wrap it up in a cone and put it in a nice big plate and then just present it that way. So that's the beauty with sashimi. It could be different shapes. Let's talk about the inevitable, which is 
the side eye, the criticism, the underhanded comments. Mm -hmm. As a teacher, what is your advice for people with sensitive hearts <laughs> when it comes to handling what they might perceive as criticism from family members, especially folks who might be more skilled than they are? You know, Japan has that filial piety thing. You can't go telling off your elders the way you want. As I got older, I didn't really start talking back till I was almost, I'm 59. Mm -hmm. Well, mom, if you don't like it, you don't have to eat it. That kind of talk didn't happen till my 40s, but I'm more <laughs> traditional. Kids today have a lot more leeway that I would have certainly been in trouble if I even spoke like that to my parents. But if you're having a family gathering, make sure you have everything ready so no one could criticize excuse you need one well you know in japan they're having that transportation issue i couldn't get it i'm so it wasn't even available in the country oh my god that's hilarious all right last question any other last minute survival tips for getting on with your competitive family in a holiday kitchen if you want to keep peace at least keep yourself out of trouble. Just watch them start arguing while you're helping grandma out on the side. <laughs> Keep busy. I do a deflection. <laughs> yeah. Oh, grandma, do you need help? I'll massage your back. It's okay. I'll just sit right here. Put grandma in front of me, massage her while everybody else. I'm massaging grandma. Keep me out of this. Right. You know, like that and stuff. And oh, I'm cleaning up. Go do whatever you want. So I just, if you're smart, stay out of it. That's my advice. I like that. Mori, thank you so, so much. You've been hilarious to talk to. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Here's what Mori taught us today. Assign roles. Pick a dish or even a specific task in the kitchen and claim it. Let others have dibs on what they want to prepare. Then stay out of each other's way. Be practical. If you know you have really high standards and meeting them is important to you, choose attainable goals and be pragmatic with your prep. Think hand rolls instead of sushi rolls. And remember, deflect, deflect, deflect. Keep the peace by focusing on others and being helpful. Clean up, chop vegetables, go and pick up ice. You know, there are other things that you need to do. Just keep yourself busy to avoid exacerbating the tension. Thank you for listening and for sharing us. How to Talk to Mommy and Papi About Anything is an original production of LWC Studios. Virginia Lora is the show's producer. Trent Lightburn makes this episode. I'm the creator and host, Juleka Lantigua. On Twitter and Instagram, we're at Talk to Mommy Papi. Bye, everybody. Same place next week.